Hey y'all, one of the weirdest run-ins with YouTube that I can remember in three years of making videos. And I'm uh, gonna go over my weekly reading, it's been awesome. Let's go. Hey everyone, Noah, everyone who reads and must converse is the channel, thanks for coming back by. Sorry to miss y'all on Friday. I do a live every Friday at 9 on my channel. Uh, try to, and I'm pretty good at it, but uh, things came up this Friday. And the main thing was that Emily had come down with COVID, so there was just a lot more to handle, right? On the home front. So, I got done working on Friday, and I knew that, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do the live. But let me uh, just put together a little uh, short video. Something that I can share on Instagram and YouTube and just let everybody know that, sorry, I'm not going to do the live, right? So here starts the weirdest, <laughs> we'll see if we can make sense out of it, right? But in my experience, you know, you're never going to figure out YouTube, right? You're never going to figure out why things happen. Okay, so I took random photos from my, uh, three random videos and photos. One was at work, a door that I was working on, and then the second one is a, a whole bunch of pizzas lined up because they got lunch for us yesterday at work, the whole crew. And then the third picture was a picture of a broken dish in my kitchen that my cat had knocked off the counter yesterday, and it just shattered. So I, I created this video, and all the writing, all the text that's on that video in another app, in some app on my phone right and then I saved it and then what I do on YouTube and on Instagram is just add some music and the caption right on YouTube uh, <laughs> I make shorts all the time right I like doing shorts it's a fun little medium and I figure it's it's just a you know like little content morsels right something that's just cool you know cool to see so i i released this one i put it out on instagram and it performed just like normal you know if you you know a couple tens of, of people saw it in the first you know 30 minutes or something and i was like okay well people are seeing that i'm not going to do the live okay and on instagram you can see who sees your stuff but on youtube it blows up within the first hour this video, I'll show you right here, has had, had gotten 800 views in the first hour. This is a reel. I'll play it as well. This is a reel um, that had nothing to do with books, nothing to do with anything uh, uh, that my channel is about except for saying, hey, I'm not going to get a live, do a live tomorrow because uh, then we got COVID. And that was written in a, another app so it, it wasn't put in through the youtube so i was just i don't i don't understand it there is one little cool piece of trivia with this as well the songs that i used are these acoustic guitar pieces right and the songs were different for each um when i released it on instagram and when i released it on youtube i used different songs but those songs are kind of in dialogue with each other so, if you can figure out uh, what, why, uh, the, the interesting little trivia to that, uh, leave a comment here or on one of the shorts, or on the short on YouTube, or on the reel on Instagram. <laughs> Let me know if you can, if you can uh, uh, figure that one out. So, it was just a wild thing, and I'm like, why, why is this happening? You know, if YouTube is going to push one of my shorts, push some video of mine, why do it on something that has nothing to do with books? Um, you know, if, if 800 people who were not part of my subscriber base saw a reel of mine that I, you know, a book centered reel, they might want, they might be interested and say, what is this guy's channel all about? But they see that short, <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, it doesn't, of course nobody subs off of that. They don't even know what, why 
I even am doing this, you know, it, the very, the, the little thing saying, you know, sorry, no live tonight. It's just right there at the end. It's ridiculous, completely ridiculous. So I'd like to, uh, hear any thoughts as to why or, or how <laughs> you think this might have gone down or why, um, this kind of thing was pushed because, um, you know, it's one of those things where I thought I would post it and then I'll take this down in a week, you know, in a few days or in a week, because it's just a, a something. It's not for content for my channel, really, you know, and it blows up like it's it's mind boggling to me. All right. <laughs> so that's it for the for the weird run in with YouTube. Y'all leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Um, I'm still in Genji. The Tale of Genji, Mirasaki Shikibu. Um, as you can see, I've hit the halfway more point, point. The halfway point in my edition is chapter 33, page 623. And it is getting rough, okay? For me, it's not too rough, okay, of a read. But it is getting to where I'm like, I'm like, oh man, I've, I'm only halfway through. How much more Genji can I, can I take, really? Because Genji is um, a psychopath. Like, he's completely, he's not a character that you can, like, relate to and that you're just, like, you know, you're rooting for or anything like this. It's, Genji is, is a complete, um, just a caricature in a, in a way. But what the tale of Genji seems to be doing now, I'm halfway through, so I feel like, well, now, you know, I'm, I'm starting to see a, a little bit bigger what this narrative is, is where it's going. And Genji, and what Genji's about is just this, you know, polyamorous, he's, he's built this huge pavilion uh, that is just housing all of his women, and they all live together, and there's hardly no conflict in this book. The conflict is all the conflicts of love. Uh, are you getting enough attention? Are you receiving your due um, in a way of, uh, you know, giving and receiving from somebody who, who says they care about you? This kind of stuff. There's, there's the kind of tensions and the obligations of love um, and the obligations and responsibilities that get in the way of love. And so there's so many obligations of love that Genji has brought upon himself that um, there's no way he can fulfill it. He's not fulfilled. His wives are not fulfilled. His, all his women are not fulfilled. And there's all this kind of, you know, everybody's just kind of, yeah, this kind of sucks, but uh, living through life and things. And we see, I'm seeing now, very, very soon, you know, very lately in the, in about the halfway point, that this, this kind of allowance of love to be this thing that is just just spread so thin and never never could re never really poured into to where it is a fulfilling a life fulfilling kind of thing has become something that is a commonplace because Genji does it and Genji is like completely famous he's a you know he's a superstar um so Genji can do it and people do this and there's these uh same kinds of situations that Genji's in with some of his wives or one wife or something like this and another uh, character will get in a situation like this and you see it turn out badly for them you see these kind of things happen and it just felt like maybe Genji's whole thing what Genji does is kind of a sickness in their culture because it is very very um attached to others and the and and the world and just being and, you know, never fulfilled, always desiring more, all this kind of stuff that there's like a negative to this. And it's almost like a cancer that is now spreading throughout the society. And this book is, uh, you know, fundamentals of Japanese culture, uh, kind of the stories and things that Japanese culture was built on. And this book is really the, the narrator for this book is really concerned with being up to date and being modern though the people being modern and up to date and things being um you know uh 
edgy on the on the cutting edge of you know the year 1000 in japan right <laughs> it's wild um but it's uh you know there's a lot of darkness to it there's a lot of sadness and i uh i i am still eager to see where it goes there's a lot of beauty there's so much poetry some of it better than others but there's a lot of commentary on this kind of stuff the narrator and um murasaki shikibu is 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 just a master uh we're getting all the kinds of behind the scenes gossip and dialogue of a of, of a court in uh, Japan that is that is very high level and and that and they have very high level secrets right <laughs> um uh, genji is a uh, you know f for lack of a better word in some ways you know genji is a monster so um don't let the don't let the love and the and the poetry and the beauty fool you ladies you know <laughs> sometimes right it's a it's a it's a wild book and amazing a, a mind blow that it was written when it was written right um i'm also <laughs> muscling through america and the culture of the cactus boosa diagnostic i've passed the halfway point here and i stopped right after the uh competitive ironing section what has what has happened here um so far is the narrative the the conflict has reached a kind of a boiling point the main characters philip and jeff here are are going on their trek on their quest and we have a, a huge digression where there is a character named ivan that uh is introduced that is very vaporeal <laughs> He is, he is a fictional character. So, a fictional character from another book by Fre Philip Friedenberg that was never finished shows up and starts talking and recounting what he's been doing since being left to, uh, you know, gather dust in the, in the drawer, right? And it's, it is a, one of the most amazing uh, creative flex, flexes that, um, you know, we've gotten to a point with Cactus Boots already where maybe, you know, you had your mind blown with a, with a meta-fictional quality. This meta-narrative, the reader is fully in, in it with the author at this point. But now, uh, we're going on a flex where the, create, the creating a new world and a possible world is what's on the table. And Philip is shown is going to show us how to do it, how he does it, right? And it is a strong, the strongest creative flex. The competitive ironing scenes are so funny, but also they are so vastly um, creative that you're just you're mind blown with how these ideas have been come up with, and where he's going to go next, and it doesn't stop. And in some of the interviews uh, that I've done and just talking with him about this book, he said um, that he that he could have just kept going. This kind of thing was so fun to write and he was so in the flow with it that he could have just kept going. And um, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind that. It is some of the most hilarious stuff. Um, some of the rules are, are <laughs> completely absurd, but build this kind of thing where. Uh, you never thought it could be so wild and then still make sense. <laughs> so um, it's a mind blow. Thank you very much, BookTube. Catch you on the next one. Bye-bye.